Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Dr Jackie Tran and I work as a researcher at High Performance Sport New Zealand. I'll be facilitating today's session on research tools. Uh, a few notes before we get started. Please post any questions you have for the presenters in the live Q&A box, uh, which is on the right side of your screen. If you do have any technical difficulties during the session, you can click on the red live support button, which should be in the top right corner of your screen as well. So this session is run in two parts. This is part one, and we'll have a short break in the middle. Uh, part one will finish promptly at 12.20, uh, so we're gonna stick closely to time. Our first speaker is Dr. Kyle Chard, who will be speaking on FunkX, a federated function serving fabric for science. Over to you, Kyle. Awesome, and you can see my slides, Jackie? Sure can. Wonderful. Well, so good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be presenting to a, an audience of, I expect, many New Zealanders here. Um, I'm going to present some work we're doing over here in Chicago. This is uh, joint work with the University of Chicago, with Argonne National Lab, and also the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I guess the, the, the major basis for this, this work is really around facilitating remote computing. And I don't think there's anything particularly new about this desire to, to uh, compute uh, remotely. And I, I guess the reasons for doing so are anything from having a resource that perfectly fits your, your computational needs to having resources that are available to having licenses or, or um, data available in the location where you need to compute. And of course, there's, as I said, there's nothing really particularly new about this. I think since the dawn of computing, we've tried to push compute to, to different locations. But over the last, I don't know, five or so years, I think we've, we've, seen, a, um, we've seen some progress in terms of, of technology that's making remote computing a lot easier for us. Anything from sort of high-speed networks, the ability for me to be able to present here today from Chicago to all of you uh, all around the world. Um, these universal trust fabrics, mostly brought on by the web, and then, of course, containers and virtualization technology. And we've seen the effect of um, these new technologies and the way that we're delivering computing, uh, especially in industry. And so obviously the adoption of cloud computing has been huge and this, this move to sort of elastic virtualized computing in the sky. And then a more, more recently, this adoption of, the, of what people call serverless computing, where serverless is this idea that the provider basically manages not only the physical infrastructure in the sky, but also the virtual infrastructure. And uh, probably the most common uh, way people think of serverless is the function as a service model. And the idea here is essentially you pick a runtime, you say you want to write something in Python, you write a, a small piece of Python code, and then you can run it one or a billion times on the cloud with fairly low latency and elastically scaling behind the scenes, where you don't need to know anything about the actual computers, about the virtual machines or containers, really anything about the software environment. And uh, um, people are even now starting to combine these functions to actually deliver sort of uh, real applications uh, composed of many things and sort of workflows. So over the last year or two, probably two years now, we've been looking at how can we adapt this function as a service model to the, the semi-unique requirements of science. And we think there's a few advantages of doing this. The first is that uh, it allows us to, to um, support different types of workloads than are currently supported with batch systems and even, even um, sort of virtualization and clouds and, and academic clouds. It lets us um, address sort of real time and interactive computing problems, stream processing. It also has some benefits in terms of application or software development in terms of making things modular, simplifying uh, maintenance and testing and being able to uh, join them together for applications. The second thing we really like about this model is that it, it provides a nice way of facilitating use of different compute resources. So often in, in applications, you'll find that one piece would, would be much better uh, running on a, on a supercomputer here in Chicago and another piece might be better running on the edge or running on a, on a, um, a GPU that happens to live somewhere else. And the third thing, I've done these in the wrong order, but the third thing, or well back to the second thing, is that it provides a nice abstraction. I think anyone that's used HPC or, or increasingly heterogeneous resources probably is aware of the fact that their, their um, interfaces are not particularly easy um, to use. So the whole function is a service model, describe your function, run it on a compute resource without really knowing about any of the lower level details is quite a, an attractive sort of way of, of, um, of computing, especially for, for scientific computing users. So what we've done is we've built the system called FunkX and um, the way that FunkX is a little bit different from your uh, traditional FAST system is it, it's what we call a federated function uh, serving ecosystem. And by federated, we mean that we're not bound to a single cloud provider. Essentially what we're doing is we're providing a cloud service for all the good bits of, of FAST where you can register your functions and run your functions, but the actual execution of these functions is happening out there in different endpoints. So people can essentially come along 
deploy their own endpoint on a laptop or on a supercomputer or on a cloud or on a specialized GPU cluster or even on like a, an edge device, which we're seeing increasingly people putting these on pies and, and other sorts of um, exotic uh, computing elements. They can deploy this endpoint software and then they're able to register and route their functions to those endpoints for execution. And so we sort of sell this as being able to fairly easily turn any machine into a function serving uh, endpoint. And at the bottom right here, um, this is just a, a quick plot of a few um, applications we're working with that show the sort of very granular uh, functions that these, these applications are composed of. And in many of these, you see a few machine learning ones at the beginning there, but the, the C, D and E are actually um, applications that are happening in real time as a result of experiments on instruments. I think in these cases, electron mic microscopy and happening at the, um, the APS beam line. And so the FunkX system itself allows us to, to basically pick where we want to run things at runtime. We can choose an endpoint. We can choose one that's closest to where we might be, um, the data might be generating, the place that's cheapest, the place that's fastest. They might not always be the same thing. Um, and a place where perhaps there's an accelerator, a GPU or a, a TPU or something available to us. So a few pictures here of showing the, the basic way FunkX works. As I said, there's a a service in the in the cloud that we operate here on um, on Amazon Web Services, so it's available most of the time when we when we haven't broken it, and people can connect to it through a REST interface or through a, a Python SDK. Uh, there's resources out there in the wild, so here we have a, a cluster and a laptop that uh, happen to run different uh, container technologies. I don't know what the situation's like in, in New Zealand, but here in the US we have um, different types of container technology running on our HPC. Singularity is probably the most well-known one, but there's Shifter and Charlie Cloud and others. And then of course, Docker running in Kubernetes clusters and, um, and personal laptops. So basically you can deploy your endpoint software here on these, um, these machines. It's entirely user space endpoint software. So you can deploy many of these endpoints for different users, for different allocations, et cetera. And you register them with this cloud service. At a later time, you or someone else can come along and register a function. Registering a function is as easy as writing uh, a Python function and calling a REST API with that Python function in it to register it. Um, we also register dependencies, um, uh, system packages, Python packages on which that function is dependent on so that we can build an environment uh, for that function to execute in the remote uh, computing system. So this is showing that, that part there, you register the function. We use the repo to Docker tool to basically take the dependencies and create a, a Docker file, which we can then port to the different uh, container technologies. Uh, and you don't need to use dependencies as well, and you don't need to use containers. So we can actually execute most, I'd say more than half of our users currently are executing without containers. They just have their endpoint set up in like a, a Conda environment on their endpoint, and then they're routing functions to that environment for execution. So once we've registered uh, functions, you can share them with other people or use them yourself. We keep a catalog uh, in the cloud that people can use. Uh, you can come along and basically choose which functions you'd like to execute and what set of arguments you would like to pass to those functions. It looks exactly like standard Python. You're just passing in um, a Python object or a Python variable into the, um, into the function call. Uh, and as a result, you, uh, you get back a UUID that you can then uh, introspect to see if it's completed and to get the result. Again, the result being a standard Python object that comes back again. So here it shows where we're trying to execute it. We pick which endpoints we want to execute on. We push the task down to those endpoints. Uh, the endpoints have their own queuing system that can queue up all these individual functions that need to be executed. The endpoints are, are capable of um, elastically provisioning uh, resources from clouds and from HPC resources or Kubernetes resources, whatever uh, compute resource you have there. We'll go out and submit like a, a Slurm job or a PBS job to get a bunch of resources, deploy some software on it, and then run the function in that uh, in that environment that you choose to run in. So there's sort of two pieces to using FunkX. The first is uh, registering your, your resources for execution. And to do this, you need to deploy this FunkX endpoint or you need to have someone else deploy it and you can then use their endpoint. Um, installing an endpoint is quite simple. It's, as I said, it's entirely Python, entirely installed in user space. So essentially you pip install FunkX uh, into your Conda environment or into your native environment. You authenticate once, uh, so authentication, we use um, the Globus auth, uh, OAuth based system where you basically, you register your, your endpoint, it will pop up a little URL saying go and authenticate here, you authenticate there, uh, and now you're, you're tied, you've locked your, tied your account to that endpoint. 
And then the final thing you need to do is if you want to use sort of uh, various backend resources, you need to provide a Python configuration that uses the parcel workflow system uh, to describe how to interact with your scheduler. If you're just running on a single node, maybe has many, many cores on it, you don't need to do anything. By default, that will just run in multiple cores on that node. But if you want to use a backend Kubernetes cluster or you want to use a backend um, Slurm scheduler or, or um, Amazon um, cloud system, you need to define a, a brief uh, configuration. We have some samples there for many of the, the fairly common uh, resources. So normally at this stage, I would, uh, I would give a demo, but I think with the 15 minute time limit, we probably don't have a lot of time to do the demo. Um, but this gives you an example of what the, the code looks like. So the left is what we need to do to set up an endpoint. As I say, you pip install it, you configure it and you start it. Um, and then if it turns off for some reason, like the machine turns off, when you come back again, you just start the endpoint again. Uh, no need to reconfigure it, no need to reauthenticate. Uh, when you come to run a function, we have a Python SDK. Uh, so this is maybe looks a little bit uh, uh, hard to understand when it's not colored nicely with the, the color coding you would expect. But essentially, you import this Funkx client, you define a, a Python function as you normally would, and then you can register that function with the, um, the client.register underscore function, just passing in the, a pointer to that function. You get back a UUID. You can then run, um, I was going to say I forgot to put the, uh, the function ID in the run command, but it turns out it's just bumped onto another line here. So I didn't try and format the slide at all because I don't normally show it. Um, but essentially when you run, you pass in the UUID of that function, which you have just registered here. You can, um, we have a search index as well, so you can discover them um, after the fact and, and reuse them. And you pass in the endpoint ID, the endpoint you want to run on. Uh, and then you can pass in whatever arguments you like, just as keyword args to the, to the run command. So here we're passing in items, which is not defined because this example was, was handwritten, not from a, a notebook. So items here would say be a list of things that need to, be, um, need to be added up. And as I said, you get back then a UUID that you can then uh, get the results of at a later time. So we've done a lot of work on um, the sort of academic side of this. We've written a few papers on it and we've investigated scalability. So we deployed the system on a couple of supercomputers here at ALCF at Argonne and NERSC um, out in California on NERSC Cori machine. Um, we did a bunch of exploratory uh, strong and weak scaling using fairly worst case scenarios. Worst case meaning very short running uh, tasks. So no op tasks that don't run for any time and one second sleep tasks that run for a very short period of time. The takeaway here is that our scaling is is working relatively well up to several thousand nodes before we start to tail off um, or several thousand containers running concurrently these are I think they're both KNL so both 64 um, core machines so we're running well up to about 2,000 containers with these very sheep, uh, short tasks if we're running on much uh, much longer tasks our scaling would of course be better and we also push the limits of how far we can scale so we ran up to 130,000 concurrent containers which is, I think about 2,000 2000 KNL nodes on, I don't remember which machine, if it was Theta or, or Cori. There's a few advantages of this system. Uh, one advantage is that we get this elasticity that's well known in, in um, functions as a service model, uh, where we're dynamically provisioning resources on demand based on workload. So this plot's just showing um, a workload where we're, we're, we're sending in a bunch of tasks at various points in time, and we're showing the system scales uh, to address those requirements. Jackie's telling me I, I've got to get off. Um, another advantage is the, the fault tolerance, the resilience side. So everything in the system is architected that we're queuing tasks with the aim of not losing them. If the worker node dies, which happens in HPC systems, we'll queue tasks at the endpoint. If the endpoint dies, we've got tasks queued at the cloud. So essentially you can turn off your, turn off your HPC machine or your laptop that's running your FunkX endpoint. And when you open it back up again, the compute task will continue to run. So I think I've got about one minute left, so I'll fly through a couple of example applications where we're using this. Um, as I said before, most of this is, is focused on uh, real-time computing associated with instruments. So one example is, is this flame spray, uh, flame spray pyroly pyrolysis um, at, the, at the MRF facility. And we use um, FunkX here essentially to run compute tasks as this flame is running so that we can optimize uh, the flame. So we basically are sending data from sensors to our HPC and GPU machines running some compute on them and feeding results back to the experimentalists who are changing conditions. Um, another example here, this is some work we're doing on COVID to um, understand crystal structure of COVID proteins. So here we're using FunkX as part of a much larger workflow where we're shipping data from, a, from instrument 
to Compute Center uh, running to various types of computing. And then the and final- And I'm gonna pause you there, Kyle. Um, I'm done. Yeah, I'm gonna pause you there. Thanks so much, okay. Kyle. Um, we've got a number of questions, so I wanna switch over to Q&A mode if we can. A number of questions, that's scary. We do, yeah, which is great. So I will uh, read through in order, time order. So uh, first question we have is from Blair. Do you have any smarts or plans for them around picking endpoints in relation to particular application concerns, such as data locality or expected function call return times and so on? Yes, yeah, so we just had a student complete his master's degree doing exactly that. So he built some models that predicted, I, I, should, have, I should have thought about what these things were in ahead of time, but it predicted transfer costs to move, um, to move data to an endpoint for compute. So you could work out how, like you could factor in the transfer costs. It predicted queuing and container startup times and it computed runtime of the actual function. And so he would wrap all of those things into a per endpoint and a per function model, and then he grouped them together to, to sort of infer properties, like many endpoints have similar computing capacity, so he'll group those into one. And then he built um, some scheduling capabilities on top of that to try and route functions to the place that they would run uh, most appropriately. Great, so that's, thanks, that's Carl. All, that's all researchy stuff. There's a master's thesis that we're a little far away from that actually being production, of course. It's, uh, at the moment, it's all on the user to pick where they want to run things. Awesome, awesome, thanks. Uh, so the next question we have is from James. Uh, how well does FunkX support other languages and ecosystems other than uh, Python and Conda? Great question. At the moment, it's entirely Python based. Um, so yeah, uh, I should have said that. You just did, so you just said it, so okay. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. I'll claim it was um, in the slides I didn't get to. I was only one slide short as well, so I, can't, I wasn't too far off. That's pretty good, that's a good effort. Yeah. Uh, a couple more <laughs> questions. Um, uh, from Blair, I understand functions can be in any language or runtime, but that the client may currently be limited to Python. That, oh, I think that's in response to the last um, question. So we'll skip over that one. Uh, the last question here is from Eric. Uh, how do users specify what HW responses, uh, resources they need available, such as GPU or TPU, for their function to run? At the moment, again, there's no way of specifying that. It's about when you um, when you deploy your endpoint, uh, you basically configure it for the type of resources, and then when you route your function, choose where you need to execute. You're picking which endpoint you want to run on. So with that, I'll, I'll I think that's done, right? That's all the questions. That is all the questions we have so far. You still got two minutes if you wanted to wrap up your last slide. Oh, okay. Well, this is great. I love the way this works. We'll go to quick quick intermission. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll briefly, if I've got two minutes, I'll quickly explain this DL Hub application. So there's another system we've built that basically allows people to publish machine learning models, get DOIs for them, get metadata for them. And then there's an on-demand inference system behind the scenes that allows you to then route those uh, requests to those, those published models to uh, various resources using FunkX. So there's a, there's a paper here at IP, IPDPS last year that uh, outlines this system. So quick summary, um, FunkX is a, a new type of FAST system that, that uh, we call Federated FAST that allows you to execute functions in different places. It enables this fluid execution model where you can essentially dispatch functions to wherever they make the most sense at whatever time you, you're, um, you're planning on executing them. And uh, our initial tests, uh, we're, we're re-architecting the system at the moment, um, mostly around concurrent user scalability, but in terms of endpoint scalability, we build on the parcel system and we've shown that to scale up to uh, uh, probably 8,000 nodes when we ran out of allocation on a, on a supercomputer over here. So I should say thank you to NSF and DOE who have sponsored this. There's a FunkX website there. If you want to give it a test, um, we have some binder notebooks that don't require you to install anything locally. So you can just run through those notebooks, see if it, see if it fits your, uh, your use cases. And then if it's interesting, you can deploy endpoints. So with that, I'm done, Jackie. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, and thanks for the questions as well from, uh, from people attending. The